We are in the continuing story uh, taken from Luke 13, verse 22, and we're moving on. We are on the other side of the Jordan. We're moving down, and we can't geographically, apart from that broad statement, give definitions on where he was, because no villages are mentioned, but Jesus and his boys are heading south in the area of Perea on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and eventually you get down below, and then you cross the Jordan, and you're almost to the doors of Jerusalem. So that's his journey, and on that journey, there's encounters, and I love the fact that God gives us encounters. And so he's teaching in villages, there's questions, there's answers, uh, there's challenges. In chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, we had the healing on the Sabbath. Uh, his, his question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And kind of everybody is, uh, <clears throat> it's one of those uh, type of questions only Jesus could ask, uh, because there's really only one answer, and yet <clears throat> we always look for a left or right door to exit or have some other uh, uh, wiseacre uh, answer to the question so that we don't have to take responsibility. And we find that in, in verse 4, they kept silent. So he healed. And then he sent the guy out. And uh, I, I, as I told you in that sermon, I don't know why he sent him out, except perhaps he would be exposed to uh, the uh, upper crusts, um, shortcomings, hypocrisy, uh, pride, and so on. And uh, we see their response again in verse 6, they could make no reply. So <clears throat> here he is at this, uh, at this lunch, or this luncheon, uh, and he has been invited, uh, perhaps as an afterthought, as we'll see in this passage in Luke 14, starting in verse 7, there I've said it, um, that it appears that um, there's this progressive dinner, uh, not in the traditional sense, but, you know, this week we're at Greg's place, and next week we're at George's place, and next week we're at Jim's place, and next week we're at Rocky's place, and next week we're at Wayne's place. In other words, it's kind of this rotation of... of um, meat and potatoes this week, and then uh, pasta that week, and such and such over here, and then fish here, and, and you go to Wayne's, and of course it's peanut butter and jelly, but you, uh, you kind of have this uh, rotation of dinners, as we'll uncover in the latter part. By the way, this uh, sermon is in two sections. Uh, it's, it's like there's a, um, in a sense, a hiccup or a uh, a deep breath uh, after verse 11 before we move on with the second part. So this is what happens. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table. So here he is at the table and like I mentioned all those names, everybody knows each other and then we have the visiting rabbi, this uh, semi-famous guy who is traveling through, so let's invite him. This ought to be interesting. And so he's there, and it's and he must be at a strategic place where when they come in, everybody looks to see where the head of the table is. And so they go to the head of the table, and of course you can't sit where the host's sitting, that wouldn't be appropriate, but you can certainly sit on the right, and if you can't sit on the right, then you can sit on the left, and those places are taken, so I'm going to sit on the second, and the second, and so on and so forth. So Jesus is uh, watching all this, and there's the head of the table, and it's really crowded. And, you know, where he is, probably no one's around. So um, he decides he's going to draw attention to this. He says to them in verse 8, Whenever you are invited by anyone to a wedding, and that would be thought of as a wedding feast, do not recline in the chief resting place, lest one more honored than you have been invited by him. Uh-oh. Okay. So my intentions coming in was to be noticed by 
the chief guy. But Jesus is saying, man, don't go sit there. Because today, Rabbi so-and-so from such-and-such -such is going to be invited, and guess where the host is going to sit him? Right where you are. Well, guess what? You showed up early, and everybody else showed up on time, and now all the places are filled except for the one in the back. So, verse 9, And he who invited you and him, having come, shall say to you, Give your place to this man. And then, in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. Now, I've got to address that verse 9, because it's, uh, there's, it's written in such a way that it should, it should show you something. So, whenever you've been invited by anyone unto a wedding, don't sit in the most esteemed place, uh, the place of honor, lest someone more dear, estimable, uh, honorable, um, all those things, esteemed, than you has been invited. And so the picture in verse 9 reads this way. The one having invited both of you, he and you, having come, so you can kind of picture, you're sitting there like this, just enjoying your, uh, your grapes, and all of a sudden, there's this presence standing up. And so you look, and it's your host. And he's looking down at you, and he will say to you, this is what's going to happen. Give to this one place. That's how it reads. Um, you could read it, give this, give up, give this place away. But it's really, I think, the person he's talking about. Give to this one place. In other words, you don't have that place. You shouldn't be in that place. This one should be in that place. And I'll tell you, um, I was invited to a um, rehearsal dinner. The family knew me. And so I walked into the rehearsal dinner place after the rehearsal. And uh, the father of the, um, of the groom did this. And uh, so I sat down, and then right behind me came a whole bunch of family, and they were standing over there like vultures looking at a carcass at my spot. There wasn't a smile on their face. And I wanted to sleep down in my chair, but the man who was in charge told me to sit there. That was my place. So it didn't matter if all those family members thought, I'm more important than that preacher guy, all he's going to do is do the wedding. Duh. <laughs> but I, I said, Richard, I can get up and move. I said, no way. This is your spot. Well, that's the picture here. You get up, give this guy your place. Now, verse 10. I'm sorry. Um, the last part of verse 9. And you begin with shame to take the lowest place. And that's exactly how it reads. And then you begin with shame the last place. And if you have notes, it's S and it's the last thing on S. To come into full possession of. To hold in a firm grip. So what do you have at this feast? You hold in your hands last place. Yay, the crowds went wild. That's your firm possession. Not first place, not the place of honor next to the host, but last place. That's your firm possession. And you, we, we kind of miss it in the English, but um, with shame to hold the last place, to hold it. That's yours. What did you come away with? Well, I got last place. Oh, what does that mean? Well, that means that... Uh, I got the drumstick without any meat on it. That's what it means. Anyway. Um, so don't go there. Don't do that. But this is what you should do. When you are invited, go and uh, having gone, recline in the last place. And Lenski has an interesting way of saying it. He says, drop into the last place. In other words, you walk in 
and you look at the last place and you literally you drop into it it's your place and that's where you set up house now you eat the grapes in the last place now notice the difference here um, so that when the one who has invited you comes he may say to you friend move up higher what are you doing down here dummy good grief there's place number two two removed from me right up there move on up what's wrong with you it's all friendly especially with the term friend especially with the term friend so he says friend move up higher then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at table with you. Whoa, look. Lidbeck's moving up higher. I thought he was the last guy on the list, but look at He must be like number one or number two on the list. Man, wish I could be like Lidbeck. Notice how I translated that in W. There will be glory for you. And yes, you can... You don't have to translate it. It's doxa. That's a word we often see in the book of the Revelation about the doxa of God, the glory of God. Uh, we translate it easily with praise or honor. But I wanted to translate it that way uh, because I wanted you to see that you guys want to be esteemed. There's glory in last place because, because you will be honored. In fact, that's what Jesus says. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So we have a principle here in part one of this part two uh, message. Uh, this portion, by the way, is unique to Luke. You're not going to find it in the other Gospels. So what is Jesus doing here? Well, according to my title, Jesus instructs regarding discipleship. Uh, humility versus pride. That's well, pretty generic, but what is Jesus um, doing here? He's responding to an attitude that is harmful. And you're looking at this and saying, hmm, what'd the guy do? Beat everybody up on the way back to last place? I mean, what, what harm are you talking about? Where's the harm? Well, this is the harm. Pride separates. Ever thought about that? Pride separates. How so? Well, it's, uh, pride separates men from men because pride says, I'm better. I don't hear any amens. <laughs> <laughs> My pride will always set me apart from you because I will always say I'm better than you. That's what pride does. So pride separates. All right, well, that's not good, and that's, that's only a part of the sermon. Let's get to the other part. How does pride separate me from God? Ooh. See, pride with God says, I'm good enough. Can any of you imagine looking into the face of your Creator and telling him, point blank, I'm good enough. I'm good enough to get into your heaven. Because my good deeds, I didn't steal from him and I didn't steal from them. And I only used a three-letter word instead of a four-letter word. See how my good deeds got? My pride separates me from you because I think that I'm better and my pride separates me from God because ultimately I think I'm better. Even though my statement really would honestly be only I'm good enough, nevertheless, that I'm good enough means that I'm better than your choice. I'm better than you think. So I'm better than you too. So pride is a horrible, horrible thing. Well, what about humility? Humility is one of those interesting things because Humility is not natural, and humility is the mark of Christ's church. Humility is the mark of the believer. 
So humility, what does humility do? It draws us together. Pride, humility. So what does humility do? It draws us together. Notice, by the way, on the one hand, when it was my pride sitting there, he just looked down at me and said, move. Whereas when I was at the bottom in humility, he came and said, friend, what are you doing? Move up. So there's two paths. There's me exalting myself. Just think for a moment, this particular church, every one of us, uh, writing down on a piece of paper, I am more important than everyone else in here. And then we, then we um, uh, have, a, have a contest, and, and the question is, how many of you think you're better than the next person? Stand up. And, of course, if, if that was our heart attitude, we'd all stand, and then we'd look at each other, and how is, it, how is it possible that you're better than me? There's no way. And then there's nobody left next week. But this is what placing myself uh, in a humble position... Um, in a strategic position in humility, this is what I can accomplish. I love, I help, I serve, I give. And all those things are an extension from my being out to where? In a sense, it doesn't matter, but out away from me into other people's lives. That's what humility does. So what is Jesus doing here? He's giving a mark of discipleship, the opportunity for these leaders to embrace a humble attitude. What a beautiful picture. Now, those of you who I um, employed, um, I would like you to read some of these scriptures which are supportive of this particular aspect of uh, humility versus pride. Uh, here's an example of a proud attitude given by James in James chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, You sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, You stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, do not God, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Boy. We have an attitude of the disciple displayed and explained by Paul. And before you read, this is this one passage. Uh, three people, Philippians 2, 1 through 4, followed by Philippians 2, 5 through 8, followed by Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection or com and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not require equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, 
being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Uh, for this reason also, uh, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Mm. There's an attitude of the disciple. The heart of the disciple stated by Jesus in the parable of the two men who prayed. One was a, uh, one was a Pharisee, uh, was he a Pharisee or scribe? I forget. And the other was a uh, publican, a tax gatherer in Luke 18, verse 14. And this is the tax gatherer speaking at the end of his prayer. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, I said that wrong. Jesus is referring to the publican who had just prayed, and he's saying that the humble one is the one who, uh, who took care of business. And finally, uh, there's two more, but uh, we'll uh, do this one. James uh, cuts to the heart of God's attitude toward a disciple in James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. All right. And uh, <clears throat> the conclusion of this portion where Jesus uh, instructs regarding discipleship, uh, humility versus pride, is summed up well by, uh, by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. So, that was part one. In part two, we have this parable extended, or this time extended, with now the host. Because remember, he was talking to everybody else who was vying for place one, slot one, slot two, slot three, slot four. <coughs> and now he's going to talk to <coughs> the host of all this. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so in verse 12 through 14, moreover, he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, since they do not have the means to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So, not to be left out, because the host wasn't buying for the first place. He was the host. But he says, uh, uh, to having invited him is, is the guy he's talking to, the host. When you make, when you cause to bring about a, um, a midday meal... Sometimes uh, we, it's translated to breakfast or uh, it actually more, <clears throat> I think, in line with what we would say today, brunch or a supper and evening meal. Don't invite those who are your compatriots, your buddies, uh, your brothers, literally. And then uh, don't invite, uh, I don't know who's rich on Park Hill Road, but... That guy over there, he's a rich neighbor. And you invite him because why? You know him? No, but he's rich. So that's why you invite him. It's like, okay. Um, but Jesus said, uh, be, what's going to happen is we're going to get back to that quote-unquote progressive dinner over time. Uh, meat and potatoes here and fish there and pasta there and so on. Uh, there will be a payback. You invited me, so I invite you. 
I invite you and you invite me. I mean, what a, what a great thing. Every five weeks or six weeks, you have to do the quote-unquote potluck. You, you have to do the cooking. But otherwise, they do the cooking. Woo! I love it. Some of you should love that. But, and this is what he says, however, instead of that is what he's saying. Um, when you, let's see, I'm going to read it here. <coughs> when a feast you make, invite poor. This is the same word we had way back in uh, the, um, the uh, Beatitudes. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. These are the beggarly. These are the ones who don't have a uh, two pennies to uh, to rub together. Uh, that's what they are. They're they're in a sense they're beggars. So when you put on a feast, invite the beggars. Okay, uh, and the maimed. The maimed are those who are deprived of a member of the body, or it's <clears throat> it's like some of them they have a useless useless hand. It's still there, but it's not usable. Um, invite the, the maimed. The lame are those who are deprived of a foot or a leg. And the blind are what the blind are. <clears throat> so invite them. And you will be blessed. Because they do not have, they do not possess, it's not within their capability to recompense or reward you in any way. Okay? But here, here's what Jesus points to, and it's beyond what is possible on this earth. For you will be repaid, rewarded, recompensed in the resurrection of the righteous. How many things have you done on earth in the name of Jesus, for Jesus, you've never received a thank you. And that's, I'm guilty of that. I just think of walking into a warm church and I don't thank whoever turns on the switch and it turns on the switch and gets it going. I don't thank them enough. Uh, none of us thank anybody enough. Um, is our reward here? Well, if you're looking for thanks here, it's going to cost you because people are <laughs> aren't thankful. Uh, so where is your reward? Your reward is coming after. So the simplicity of this is do not act in a manner that simply benefits you. By faith as a disciple, act in a manner that benefits others with no motivation or possibility of being paid back here. And we, of all people, by faith, especially as the theme of Advent today is hope, need to know that our reward literally is coming down the pike. When we stand in the, in, in the presence of our Savior, and He weighs out our acts of faith, because of and in the name of Jesus and the acts done in the name of Wayne, for Wayne's sake, uh, wood, hay, and stubble, all gone. Uh, for Jesus, by faith, gold, silver, precious stone. Burned, but it's still there. So uh, these, this is the <clears throat> message as we uh, consider our life as disciples. We walk by faith. Um, and we walk in obedience to the Lord and what he's going to do, what he does for us. I'm not saying there's no reward here. Why, does, why do Kathy and I continue to, uh, to come here? It's because it's beautiful. <laughs> we go away fuller than when we came uh, because of you. It's, it's, a, it's a blessed reception that we receive. Um, Ultimately, however, we know that whatever re reward we get here is temporary, but the reward we get there is permanent. So that's where we go. Father, by your grace and mercy, we, uh, we draw breath and live our lives. I pray that we as your people might recognize the value of serving you first and serving self uh, last. 
uh, last place in human eyes is uh, is not that bad because uh, being uh, rewarded by you certainly is something that surpasses any reward we can receive here on earth. So Father, may our motivation constantly be as disciples of Jesus Christ by faith to follow him and recognize that it is worth every moment. It is worth the cost. May we serve you well in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>